So now we'll talk a little bit, and it's very briefly actually, about ethics in psychological research. Um, so the ultimate question being how far can we go for the sake of psychological advancement? And there's a lot of guidelines kind of taking us along. As, and what you have to understand for the AP exam as to what we can and cannot do in, for the sake of research. There has been, unfortunately, a history of unethical science in World War II, mainly in Nazi Germany. Just think about um, the very unethical stuff going on there and the testing that they were doing on humans, right? Not just on animals, and that we think unethical science being with animals and like the testing of makeup and such on them, but it's even more awful than that. Um, radiation experiments 1944 to 74, um, just experimenting on humans is the, let's see what happens with radiation. And then Tuskegee, an experiment conducted until 1972 um, on people who suffered with syphilis is to see that how effective the drug was and half of them were given a placebo and were allowed to die. Um, so being unethical because they weren't properly treated when they thought they were being properly treated. So how, how do we make sure that this stuff doesn't happen now and in the future? What, what do we have to do? Well, the American Psychological Association, the APA, came up with a code of ethics um, created in 1953, which you could argue has not necessarily been followed to the fullest extent, um, but it's, it's still good to know what, what are those guidelines. So, they uh, mandated that any institution that's going to do research and that's going to do research in their name, I'll explain what that means, they must have an institutional review board or an IRB. So the University of Cincinnati, for instance, they have a lot of different schools, right? A lot of different colleges within that university, like the College of Law and Education, um, maybe like forensics, something like that. So each one of those colleges, each one of those schools within the university has a bunch of professors who don't just teach, right? That actually is not their main job. It's like half of their job. The other half being that they go out and they do research, not just field research, um, but also research that we might think of um, in looking back in past literature, et cetera. Anyway, if they're going to do a study Right, if the School of Psychology at the University of Cincinnati, if any professor is going to do an experiment where they are using humans or animals, the University of Cincinnati's IRB is the panel that must approve that research. Right, They have to uphold the rules that the APA makes. So what are those rules? What makes research ethical? First and foremost, each researcher, experimenter, experiment itself must get informed consent. So they must inform potential participants about every aspect of the study that might influence their decision to participate. And then ensure that participation is voluntary. So the participant must know this is voluntary. You are allowed to leave with no penalty at any time. If there's a penalty if they leave halfway through, it becomes unethical. Now, what about when um, it's children, right? What about when it's minors? Here's the thing, minors, anybody under 18 can't sign, can't sign written consent. They can't sign any legal document, so they can't sign an informed consent form. So the experimenter must continuously get assent from the child in order to proceed. Okay, so um, <clears throat> I had a pro, well, it was a professor when I went to this workshop and She's a psychology professor, a neuroscientist, so it was very exciting for her when she was having children and they were getting older and they were able to participate in, um, in experiments, right? Well, here's the thing. She said that, you know, I, I believe she was allowed to observe one of her children being, you know, experimented on. Um, but they were just kind of asking questions, and every three questions or so, the experimenter would say, are you feeling okay? Um, do you understand what's going on now? And is everything good? Are you okay, essentially? So assent is continuously asking how the child is doing to ensure that they are not on some emotional roller coaster, that they understand what's going on, they still want to participate, and they have to continuously get that. Now, although they have to get informed consent and let them know of every aspect of the study, they are allowed to have deception, to use deception, to essentially lie. And you might think, what? How are they allowed to lie? 
why? Well, let's talk about this. They, the experimenters must only deceive the participants when it is absolutely essential to the study and must tell about the deception at the end of the study during debriefing. Okay, so for instance, in Solomon Ash's line study, which you're going to learn much more about in the very near future, um, they had 10 people in a room, but only one was a participant. Nine of them were actors. So the one participant didn't know that everybody else in the room was actually acting and not technically participating. That is deception. That is the experimenter lying to that participant. Now, don't get all emotional and, oh, they lied to them. It's deception, but it's for a purpose. Um, so afterwards, the experimenter just had to tell the person, everybody else in the room was an actor, why did you actually conform? That study being about conformity. Protection from harm and discomfort seems pretty obvious. They have to minimize any discomfort or risk involved in the study, not just physical, but emotional. Okay, so like in Milgram's shock experiment, they were not actually shocking people. That's not what makes Milgram's experiment unethical is that they were, you know, electrocuting people. No, it's that the participant believed they were shocking and ended up believing they were killing someone. That is emotionally scarring. That is completely unethical. So they have to prevent participants from suffering any long-term negative consequences. And they have to let the participant know you are free to participate, you are free to withdraw whenever you want. Confidentiality, they have to keep personal information about the participants a secret, um, but also their participation in that experiment secret. Um, they have to let them know, let the participants know your personal information is not going to be disclosed. And then debriefing, this is a huge vocab term. They must reveal all relevant information about the research and correcting any misimperceptions, impressions, I'm sorry, misimpressions or deception it created. So they are allowed to deceive only if they properly debrief at the end. So participants must leave the study in the same way they arrived. So another funny story the professor was telling you about when I went to that workshop with her children. Well, when she was in college, she was master, getting her master's, I believe. She was 21 and going to go participate in the study. And the study was on how alcohol consumption influences flirtatious behavior. So she's sitting in a room and she's drinking alcoholic beverages. Again, she's of age. And in walks this rather attractive fellow. And they essentially are just measuring how she talks with this person in comparison to how she did when she was not intoxicated. Well, during debriefing, they had to kind of tell her, this is why we did all of this. And here's some cookies, here's some water, here's a pillow, take a nap sober up and then you're allowed to leave. They have to leave in the same way they arrived. A child can't leave crying when they arrive totally stable, right? They have to leave the same way they arrived. This is a not very good picture, but a picture of a consent form. Um, and it just kind of tells them my participation is voluntary and confidential, et cetera, et cetera. And they sign and print. So that's what uh, a signed consent form would look like. So not always in research, and most of the time in research, we're not using humans. Even though it's psychological science, right, it's all about behavior and mental processes, we can still use animals for the advancement of psychological science because their behavior is interesting in and of itself, but also because research with animals can give information that would be impossible or unethical to collect on humans which makes you kind of sad, right? Like we won't do it to humans, but we'll do it to animals. Yes, and if you knew some of the research that was going on that eventually benefited humans, you, if this hits a soft spot for you, which it does for me too, it eventually works out. Animals are not usually subjected to extreme pain, starvation, or other inhumane conditions, right? Don't think that. If animals are to be harmed in research, it must first be deemed necessary to benefit human welfare, and that must be incredibly obvious, or else it is not done or even okay for research. And that's, that's totally up to the IRB. 
There are guidelines as to how to care for animals in research, just as there are for humans. And a lot of people in science would argue that there's more guidelines for animals than there are humans. Because with animals, you have to keep them there, right? They are lab animals, so you have to house them, feed them, keep them clean. There's all kinds of guidelines on when you have to feed and clean, when you have to water, and when you have to exchange their cages. and. There's a lot of guidelines there that don't exist for humans. So again, who says it's ethical? It's right back to the APA in 1953 with their code of ethics, um, and that the animal research must also be approved by an IRB. Um, it's just the Animal Care and Use Committee. So what makes it ethical with animals? There's kind of like an ABCs of laboratory animal research. It has to be appropriate, nothing cruel and unusual. Um, but here's the thing, what you might think is cruel might not be cruel in the name of science as long as it's for science and done in a respectable manner. And then beneficial, it must benefit human psychological research. Of course it does, that's the only point of doing it. And it must be caring. They have to care for the animals, not necessarily love them, although that would be beneficial, um, but keeping their cages clean, keeping them fed and watered. Now, there are some animal rights arguments that are kind of involved here and go against um, the use of animals in research. The utilitarian argument uses principles of equality to oppose animals in research. All animals can suffer, therefore they shouldn't be subjected to, to the research and that lifestyle. Then there's the inherent value. They ask who is entitled to hold rights. Animals should not be treated as renewable resources like coal or water, whatever. But I mean, it, it kind of makes sense, right? So again, as long as it is deemed to be beneficial for psychological science, they can use animals.